morning, everyone. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Kirk Chambers. This is Derek Rossetti. We work for Possible Mobile. Uh, and we're here to talk to you about mobile QA. I think this is, this is the first QA talk I've been to at a conference, which is pretty cool. So, uh, yes, let's get into it. Um, just a little bit about us at Possible Mobile. We're an app consultant shop. Um, we, do, we do a lot of sports apps, so we might have a couple of like sports-centric metaphor metaphors. So. Just going to tell you that now, so that if you're a little confused why we're, why we're using those, it's because that's what we have some experience with. So, um, I mean, just move on. Does it work? That's kind of our, our uh, corporate slogan that we've got at the Greater Possible Oswald Office. Uh, and we included that on here just because a whole lot of people don't really know what Mobile QA does. Uh, at Possible, Possible Mobile, we kind of wear a lot of different hats, uh, kind of... Do, do your typical QA role where you are running through checklists, uh, just doing standard QA analysis type stuff. But we also kind of put on business analyst, analyst hats, uh, spend a lot of time going through requirements, trying to find holes in that. that. Uh, and so really, it's just uh, the whole mentality is, is, does it work? Not just, did you run through the spreadsheet, but does the app experience work? work? Uh, is it working like you would want an app that you have just downloaded and installed, installed work? So, I mean, why are we here? Well, we're here because testing is hard, it's hard, especially when you do things like try biting your laptop. But um, but, um, just sort of like a quick schedule of what we'll talk about. Uh, the elephant in the room, it's, auto it's automation. We're not really going to address how to do automation, but uh, we feel it's important to bring up because that's what a whole lot of people like to talk about with mobile QA. QA. Um, but then from there, we'll just kind of go into a very basic how to write a test plan. plan. Uh, we'll do some deeper analysis on common problems that flows out of that, that. and then uh, with the leftover time, we'll just do a bit of talk on QA process and, and you. So, as I mentioned, we got automation. Both, both Android Studio and Xcode are supporting it now. Uh, it's been, been an item in both of Google and Apple's keynotes, so why am I not just up, just up here telling you how to write an automation test platform? Well, well, I was playing like a rock band, and there was a loading screen that had this statistic stick. And I thought it was a good example of some big O time complex complexity notation. You might remember that from school, like a million years ago. But, but um, there's 915 million possible ways to combine six two by four Lego pieces. And so just some, if you're, if you're building an app that simulates building Legos, and you try to just brute, brute force testing some of your options, if you did one case a second, it'd take 30, 30 years to finish. Did one case per millisecond, you're still looking at over a week to, te to test every combination. Um, and then just sort of my bold point there is most, uh, most automation tools that I've used, they will kill and relaunch your app uh, bet uh, between every test case. So what's my whole point with this? Well, te testing every case is impossible. Uh, I hear a whole lot of people just being like, yeah, we'll do some, do some type of automated testing, it'll be great. Well, it's a lot, a lot harder than just saying, yeah, we'll, we'll come up with a script, we'll test every case, it'll be fine, fine. There's actually a lot of work you have to get into to have a good, solid test test plan. So I mean, what if there's a better way than just brute, for brute forcing your way uh, through all of this, like knowing what you're doing, like modeling the the app, like making test cases. And since this is a series 100 talk, we're actually going to, actually going to take you through a quick example of how to make a test case. Know what you're thinking? Thinking that sounds boring. But just bear with me. The reason why I'm, going, why I'm going to do this is I've actually used a lot of apps in the App Store and in the, and in the Play Store that will fail what I'm about to show you. It's very, very basic. It's sort of the happy path way to test an app. But, uh, uh, you know, I've used apps that fail it. So if you're not going to do a simple thing like this, this there's really no point to even get on to talking about some of the deeper problems you'll run into. So, I mean, let's get into it. Uh, I'm going to use a very simple example, example app. It's the alarm clock app. It's how I got here this morning to make sure I woke up. Uh, I'm using it because you've all probably used either this app or something very, very similar this very morning. So you all know what the states are and it'll be easy to follow along. Follow along. At least that's my hope. So I mean, you got no alarms. You can set an alarm. You have an alarm set on. You can turn it off with that little toggle button. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, so let's get into it. How are you going to actually, actually test an app like this? Well. The way that I would do it is, is something like a flow diagram uh, or a state diagram if you come, if you come from engineering, finite state machine, uh, user flow diagrams. These are, these are all terms you may have heard, so I mean, how do you construct one? Well, let's just start with, start with having no alarm set. I'm going to call this my first state in my, in my ad. Um, and I'm sort of collapsing these into one, one state, state right now of just no alarm set, meaning at no point in time should an alarm ring. It's easy, easy, pretty straightforward. Go on to another one. 
Uh, a new state, a state. Well, I've got an alarm set. Pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, no? it's a different state from the other one. We expect a different uh, response out of, of the app, which is an alarm is on. Uh, and then, well, how do I go, do I go between them? Well, we got this type of screen where I'm actually setting an alarm. So I'm not going to call, going to call this a state. I'm just going to call this a transition between states. And so, and so if I take these two states, and I got some screenshots up there showing you just how, just how it all fits together. You got not set, you set an alarm, and you have an alarm set. set. I mean, this should be pretty easy and pretty straightforward. Um, it's, just, it's just, this is how you use an app. You have one state, you go to another state. Um, what if I do this for the entire alarm clock applica application? Well, you've got the not set, the alarm set, and the ringing state. You can go from not set to set. Uh, you can cancel the alarm. Uh, obviously, when you're in the alarm set state, when you reach time X, you expect it to start ringing. Start ringing. If I hit snooze, I expect the alarm to still be set, but the ring to seem to stop. And then obviously, it's, it's ringing. I expect to be able to deactivate it and get it and go to the not set state. So you kind of get this flow diagram going along. You've probably seen these before. If you're a designer, you'd call it a flow, uh, you know, using a user flow diagram. It'd be a lot prettier than what I've got here, but they're for two two different things. Which is one of those might be selling to a customer. This one. Is really, is really just saying what states can the app get into? Uh, how do I move through them? It's got very clear, clear and concise usage patterns. Uh, obviously, it's supposed to, supposed to hit every state that a user can. Um, it's readily convertible in, into a test plan, which I will show you. Uh, and also, just a final, final comment I'll make is that from a good state diagram like this, you can, easy, can easily infer the requirements of what the app is supposed to do. And sort of by proxy, proxy, if you have good requirements, you should be able to easily construct one of these. Most important, what I just said has nothing to do with the development process. Uh, so you can actually start thinking about how you're going to test an app, app long before a line of code gets written. Um, a lot of times, times QA can be a bottleneck because it will get stuck at the end of the chain. If you, if you start doing things like this, it's a way to pull QA uh, uh, earlier into the process. So as I mentioned, you can. So I mean, it, would this be different than, let's say, the state of state diagram that a business analyst would create, or should this be something that is input into the, into the QA process? Uh, this is really more something that like I create. I'm not actually sitting down and making this in this diagram when I'm testing, but I go through this type of process. Right. So it's coming from me, not necessarily necessarily a business analyst. Right. But like I said, at possible mobile, we kind of wear multiple hats, mm -hmm. and so that's sort of what I mean by that. We're, not just running through through test cases, we're starting to do analysis like this on the requirements. So, yeah. um, so as I mentioned, you can. Uh, this is readily convertible into a test plan. So how are you going to do something like that? Like that? Well, really simple. I go from one state to another state. I'm going from not from not set to the alarm set state. Very simple. You know, I've got my current state with no alarm, no alarms. I tap the plus icon, and I verify that I get into that new that new alarm model screenshot that you saw. From there, I set the alarm from that, from that, and I verify that I have a new alarm present. Very easy, very straightforward. Forward. I'm just going from one state in the app to the next state in the app, and my steps are following the arrow, verifying I go from one state to another. Sort of by proxy, you can then do the next thing. If you've got a single alarm set, you follow the next arrow, go to the alarm canceled state, verify, verify you're in the alarm deactivated state. This is very simple, very straightforward, forward, but it's graphical and it's honestly pretty hard to screw up doing something like this. This, From there, if I've got the entire alarm clock app, you, know, you can really just see how this goes into a test plan. Um, you've, got, you've got the not set state, follow an arrow, go to the alarm set, and you get your top rows. rows. Go into the alarm canceled state, and you, go, uh, you get your third row on, row on there, and then I don't want to read the entire thing because you all know how an alarm clock work, works, but you just go in one state, Follow an arrow, you're in the next state. state. Pretty easy verification steps. Um, and then this, this isn't really like a super professional example, but then you can just throw on a couple of extra, extra columns like did it pass or fail? Makes it very easy to show your, P, your PM or your devs what part of the app is working, what part of the app is not working. working. And also we've got that completed column on there. Uh, you know, this is a pretty, tr pretty trivial example with like 10 test cases. When you have a huge app that can have like, have like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of test cases, you're probably not going to run the whole, th the whole thing every time. It can be equally important to report to the PM, well, wh what part did I test? What part have I not tested in this particular run through? So just to you know, give a little bit more insight, insight to the test plan, it's like it easily flows from doing a state diagram. It can stand on its own. 
At no point in time in here do I need to go reference the, reference the requirements, reference screenshots. Uh, you might need to for the verification steps and steps if you're not familiar with the app in order to make sure it looks right, but at no point in time do I, do I actually need to go consult other documents to test the, yes, the app. I just follow the steps in there. Very straightforward execution. It's highly re really repeatable. I can do it. Derek can do it. You can do it. Your mom can do it. Anyone can do it. You should get the exact same results regardless of who's doing it. Um, reaches all relevant states. Obviously it should because I built it off that, off that state diagram which has every state. Uh, it gives you some good reported reporting on completed versus not completed. And really more important is, is it provides you know, a QA and team review. You can see what was tested, what, did, what wasn't tested. You've got that accountability in there. So I know, I know what you're thinking. Like That was all very basic and simple. That's what we might call like a happy path, te path testing. Again, I'm kind of showing you that because I have used apps in the App Store, store that fail basic tests like that. Uh, if you're not going to go through this happy path, happy path testing, the stuff that we're going to talk about now, uh, not that it isn't important, important but like, if it's not working the way you think it should, tearing into it a little bit more, more is n really not the best use of your time. So now we've got a happy path. Where do we go from there? Uh, it's something that if I were talking, I were talking about state diagrams, it'd be like tearing apart the states. What defines a state? Tearing apart your, apart your transitions. How can those go wrong? And uh, so I'm going to hand it off to Derek. Derek, and he's going to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, now we know how to write a test case. We know, what, we know what a test plan is. But what should you put in those test cases and plans? You know, you look start. Where do you start? You always do the happy path, guys. Guys, it's the simplest form of testing. You should just make sure it's on your testing te check them checklist. Ad hoc testing. It's another one where you know you're done doing your, doing your happy path. You have a little bit of time. Just use your app. See what's going on. You also have negative testing. Make sure that if something unexpected, unexpected happens in your data from an API or a user input, that it still handles you know, those cases and that you don't show some weird crash or some error to the user. user. And always repeat your test. Do it once, do it 10, 10 times. Because your users are not going to launch your app once, navigate to the video, the video section, and then close your app and never use it again. It's not how our users work. They, they use the app many times, multiple days. Also, if you say you support, support something, Test it. If you say you work on 7.0 and up, make sure you make sure you test every device, every OS. So what is happy, what is happy path and what it isn't? Always test it. It's pretty simple. But don't don't stop there. It does not cover what a user is going to do. I can guarantee you most most of the time users are going to get in your app and do the exact opposite of what you think they're going to do. They're going to, do. They're going to go straight from your home page straight to the video when you thought they'd go through the menu. Through the menu. That's not how it's going to work. Just like in Mario Kart, people are going to find a way off that, off that road. They're going to drift around that corner too hard. They're going to fall off. So we want to make sure, to make sure that when they fall off that they're in your app and in an okay experience. Negative is positive, guys, for, for us. We want to make sure that we are testing what happens when bad or unexpected data or input is put into our app. You say, you say your API returns something that you weren't expecting. You want to make sure that we handle it okay. We, we say that... Um, a user puts a password in that was not up to your standards. We don't just crash or give them some stupid error message that says, oh, well, can't handle, can't handle this. What do we do now? Yep, did they really just do that? that? They did. They totally said, if you're having trouble after the, up the update, just go ahead and uninstall it and reinstall it. Upgrade, 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 guys. We don't want to have that. We want to make sure that when you upgrade your apps, are, are still functioning as they are intended. We don't want users to have to uninstall and reinstall, reinstall because guess what? If I was told to uninstall and reinstall from the patch notes, I'm not, I'm not going to reinstall your app. There's just no reason to. Always make, always make sure you're going from store builds to release builds. The easiest way for iOS to do this is from the store to a test flight build. This way you know there's no intervention with whatever you built in your machine. Also look for the, for the following. When you're upgrading, make sure you don't have any database or data issues. And if you think you are, think you are drop your database and rebuild it. There's no reason to poss possibly run into an issue. Also, make sure you have no debug options. We don't want to don't want to get in the state where a user can, you know, swipe right and pull out your pull out your debug menu and crash the app because you have a crash button there. We don't want that. We also want to make sure that users' data is retained. If they, if they were logged in and watching video before they upgraded, they shouldn't have to log in again. That's one of the worst uses of an app. You know, I hate that when I'm in, in, in an app upgrade and now my settings are all changed, I'm getting notifications again, what's going, what's going on? That stuff shouldn't happen. We should make sure that we have the exact same setting, settings we did before. 
And then after you did that, do it again, and, and then four more times, and then four more times until you think you're done, and then do it once, do it once more. We want to make sure that we're thoroughly testing, testing, and repeated testing because it may not happen the first time or the second time, but stuff stuff happens third, fourth, tenth, fifteenth times. Get to know your app, guys. You know, take it out to dinner, bring it bring it out during commercial breaks, use it in the morning when you wake up. Uh, most Americans now use their phones before they get out of bed. So if, you're, if your users are going to do it, you can do it too. Now I'm not saying lay down your bed all day and, day and test your app, but use it as your users are going to. Don't just think, well, I got the, I got the requirements, I'm going to test A to Z, and that's how our users are going to do it because that's how we wrote it. We wrote it. Well, the user didn't sit in your requirements meeting and tell you what they were going to do with it. Do with it so. And then think, what if, if, what if I did this, what if a user did this, what if Data was, data was bad. You always want to have that mentality as a QA. What if, what, what, hap what happens if this, what happens if I? So that's the biggest question for QA, what if? if. Then you have an app launch. Well, well, a lot of issues happen around app launch. And you'd say, well, how's that? I launched the app, it works, the app, it works every time. Well, how did they launch the app? Did they tap on the icon, the icon? Did they resume it? Did they open it via deep link? There's not a lot of ways a user can get into your app, so you want to make sure you test the different flows, flows into your app, not just how your app handles once it's open. So, I mean, let's just look at the app icon tab, just straight from the back, 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 uh, desktop. You have your network connection issues. What if, they, what if they tap it and you don't have network and you require an AP, API call? How does your app, does your app handle that? What if you need permissions to launch, but they changed it, the user, user turned off permission in between launches? I mean, how does your app handle that? You know, you know where where are they landing at? Did the API change to make it so that now they are supposed, they are supposed to land on the networks page instead of the watch page? We want to make sure make sure that we handle that correctly. And again, back to the API state: has it changed? Has your has your data changed? Is your app going to handle it okay? Are you going to crash? First launch versus uh, subsequent launches. Did it work the first time? First time this, the tenth time. Like I said, stuff happens there. We have seen issues. And then upgrade versus clean install. You have no idea how I many late nights we've had, we've had fixing issues where we run into upgrade issues because we just didn't think about a case, a case or think about a data change or think about some new SDK we threw in. So stuff happens. We want to make sure that upgrades always work. And there's a huge, there's a huge difference in background versus foreground actions. So are your ad, call, ad calls being done on foreground and app launch or just on foreground? Ground? Are these requirements you guys need to talk about with your... PM, PMs and everybody, these kind of things sometimes don't fire, and we need to make sure they're firing every time, every time. And an app deep link, does it matter where, matter where it came from? A notification from Facebook? You know, we want to make sure that we get into the correct place in the app from wherever we got the, not not the notification or the deep link. And what happens to the current state, current state of the app? Say they had the app backgrounded and they were on the watch tab, and now you've got a deep, a deep link to go to a game. What happens, guys? Do we after we tap the back button, button or tap somewhere else in the app? Do we go back to where we were? Do we close the app? Close the app? These are kind of things we need to make sure we're getting right. And then back to the hardware. We say we support 6.0 up in tablet and tablets. We better make sure we test 6.0 up in tablets. We don't want to miss something because there are device size changes, processors, processors, screen resolutions, and memory limits. We want to make sure that we test all the different scenarios, scenarios here because sometimes. If you say you support 6.0 up in tablets, there, there is someone who's going to have a 6.0 up in an iPad mini, and you better make sure that if you say, you say you support it and it doesn't work in that device, then you're the one that looks bad, not them. And I know a lot of devs have this issue. Emulators and simulators do not, do not fully replicate these issues. I, if you say it, right, if it works, on, works on my simulator my machine and it doesn't for my device, well, we need to make sure it works on the device. The device. Because people are not running our apps on simulators. It's not how it works. <laughs> And also hardware states, we have spotty, spotty data connection. What if someone didn't have data on their machine after they installed it? What if they went out in a plane? Make sure, it's, make sure it still works. What if they turn location services off or they never had them then? We need to make sure that we either prompt the user for that or we say, hey, we're not, we're not, we can't move forward until you turn this on. Also low power, low power mode. What if we require a network call or something that requires higher battery life? Battery life? Are we going to function OK? Now I'm going to hand this off to Kirk for, Kirk for permissions. So this is uh, Jay, Jay, the CTO of our company. The nice generic looking laptop. I'm probably getting fired and fired for using that photo. But he wrote this article a few years ago, you know, which is uh, camera availability and focus on assumptions. 
And uh, I, really, I really wanted to call this one out just because this was an interesting test case that they found that um, we really had no idea about it uh, sort, of, sort of until it happened. And you can turn off, off certain hardware states at an OS level. So you might think, oh I've, got, oh, I've got a phone, I've got an iPad, I'm going to have a camera. Well, you've got parental controls, controls on that, and you can actually turn these things off at an OS level. And, and so there was one device where someone had turned the camera off. There wasn't, it wasn't even a camera dot app on the device. And so when you try launching the app and it looks and it looks for a camera, not only is it you don't have permission, it didn't even have access access to it, and the app crashes. So is this a a very common case in case probably not, but it's worth checking to see what hardware things are you expecting to have to have on your app, and uh, whether or not someone can turn those off, and whether or not whether or not your app can handle those gracefully. It'd be a lot better to give the user a message than to just just hard crash and then say, well, what happened here? Um, and then moving on to like kind of like permissions, you know, more in general, you got usually denied by default. Default. This is why they're granted at runtime. So why you install a new app, it starts asking you, hey, hey, can I use your camera? Stuff like that. Uh, and a user can either, either allow them or deny them. If they deny them, you need to be able to handle that, give them flows or those where it just doesn't crash because there's no camera. Uh, but then also, if a, user, if a user has approved them, it's important that you recheck these states uh, at some point, um, like on app resume, because really at any, at any point, a user can background the app, go into settings, and revoke a permission. Uh, you know, probably not the most common thing for them to do, but it's definitely something uh, uh, that a user is capable of doing. They can go to any arbitrary screen, background your, around your app, turn off the camera permission, go back into your app. What's going to happen? Is the app, is the app going to crash? Is it, am I on a screen, I back out, and then go to a camera section, section and it crashes? So you need to be aware it's not just on app launch, but a user can, user can really turn off uh, permissions kind of whenever they want to. Um, and then, y'all remember this game? It was huge a little, huge a little while ago. I loved it. Y'all remember this screen? This was the bane, bane of my existence in early July. But why am I talking about this? About this? To rag on Pokemon Go, and I thought it was a great game. But in early July, I, there was something kind of funny that was happening. I could play the game from like 10 p.m. PM to midnight. I could not play the game during daylight hours at all, at all. Why am I talking about that? Your app doesn't live in a vacuum. Uh, uh, the ultimate user experience isn't always going to be defined by your app proper. Uh, it's going to be talking to a server somewhere to get data. So let's talk a little bit, a little bit about the data that's in your app and how that might go wrong. Um, ob obviously, you got some local user data, probably some form of database like Core Data or Data or some SQLite implementation. Um, it's important to ask, you know, ask, you know uh, is that data consistent? Uh, you know, I was talking, talking a little bit earlier about just app states, but how are those states defined? Uh, do you have redundant data in your database? If so, how are conflicts going, just going to be handled? If you've got, say, player stats, and you've got like an individ individual player feed, and then sort of like a giant group of players, and they've got redundant data, what are you going to do if those two data feeds aren't matching? How is, how is that going to be handled in your database? Um, and then a little bit uh, more of an edge case is you can definitely store user keychain data. data. It's possible that if you're logged into an app, uh, a user could delete it, reinstall install it, they relaunch your app, and they're logged in again. Mm -hmm. uh, this you know, really, you know, really only happens if you're not cleaning up the keychain, but it's an interesting question of what's going to, going to happen if a user logs in, deletes the app, changes their password, password, and then reinstalls it. Is it an edge case? Yes, but what's going to, what's going to happen? Are they going to be locked out and not able to use the app on the reinstall? Uh, um, you got things like user defaults and local assets. Um, you know, these, these probably shouldn't break too much, but it's still worth going through, making sure that you're not viol violating any assumptions. Do you have all of your assets in the right place? Are your assumption assumptions about what data a user has uh, going to be valid? Uh, um, but then also, like I said, your app is not in a vacuum. You've got API, API data, probably coming from a server somewhere. This will likely be in structured, structured data of some kind, you know, XML, JSON. Uh, what are you gonna do if the XML, the XML or the JSON is poorly formatted? or if it has data fields you're not expecting, data, data types you're not expecting. Is your parser going to crash because you're getting an array instead of an integer? Stuff like that. Uh, images, are you, are you fetching the right size? What are you going to do with the image 404s? Um, um, Feed-based states, and that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit more. It's, it's as I was mentioning, we, we do sports apps a decent amount. So, so what if we have got a game that's going from like round one to round two to overtime to time to done? We've got states. Uh, what are these being defined, defined by? Uh, what data flags are actually controlling what round the game is in? Is in? 
again, is it only in one place? Do you have multiple redundant uh, uh, flags going on? Is all the data for a state transition present? present? Uh, and if you've got overlapping uh, data keys, what's going, what's going to happen if only one of them changes but the other one doesn't? Is the app going to crash? Are we going to toggle back and forth between the two states? And again, this is, this is, the answers to these might be more of a business question as to what you want to see, want to see happen. But it's important to make sure that like, the app isn't crashing in these states. states. If it's supposed to just respect what the feed is saying, make sure it's respecting what the feed, what the feed says, even if it might be a little bit chaotic. Um, and, then it's also, and it's also important to note that these state transitions are possible while the app is open. Something that I will see uh, pretty often from usually more junior, junior devs is state one works great, state two works great. But if I'm in the app in state one and the data changes to state two, it doesn't, doesn't auto update. If I kill the app and relaunch it, then I see the new data. Make sure, make sure you can go through these states with the app open. Um, you know, is the app background, background or do you have background app refresh? Um, make sure that those processes, processes work. Like if the data state changes while it's in the background, are you getting a silent crash? crash? Maybe not the worst user experience because they're not going to see the crash, but still not good because then they have to completely relaunch the app. If they had some state, state that they were hoping to stay in, now they've lost that. Um, was the app kept killed? So if I was in state one, killed the app in state two, usually this, this will work pretty well, but it's still important to test that if I was in state one, state one and then I launched the app in state two, does the app correctly launch into this state? Uh, and then you've got, say, maybe some, some missed connections going on here. What happens if I kill the, app, kill the app in state one, the server goes from state one to state two, state two, state two to state three, and then I launch the app. Uh, does the API have enough data there in order to properly show the app, you should now, should now be in state three, not still in state one, or is it expecting to go through the whole gamut, gamut of the state transitions? Um, and then also, an equally valid, equally valid case that you should probably be worrying about is, what happens if the API has a, has a hiccup? I mean, generally, if you're an app developer, you're not going to be controlling what's, com what's coming from the server. So what happens if the state two data is just missing and we go straight from state one to state three? Can the app handle that? Can it do, can it do these transitions cleanly? And then the final one is you kind of you got this maybe retrograde motion that I alluded to. Uh, what happens since if you need to go from like state one to two back to one? Now, it seems like a very odd, very odd case. If you're making a sports app, could you ever have a game that starts, starts, finishes and then goes back to being in progress? Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, what will probably be a more common case is, did you, did you have an API hiccup? Did it incorrectly go into state two, two, someone on the data team goes, oh crap, we made a mistake, change it back to state, state one. Can the app recover from these states? Um, and also, maybe it's a manually edited feed. Maybe there's not some automatic process happening, but you have a man, a man, or a, just some like data entry guy literally typing in what state the state the app's supposed to be in. What if they make a mistake and then someone finds it, finds it and corrects it? Uh, you know, will the app then be able to pick up the, cor the corrected state and go back to how it's supposed to be? And again, like this, a lot of these might seem more like business questions, but it's important, important to make sure that the app is handling it gracefully. Even if you don't have a clear requirement of, of well, it needs to go from state one and then backwards, you need to make sure, make sure at bare minimum the app isn't crashing in these states, that it's doing something that you, that you expect. And so, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you, actually, how you actually test these states with the black box. That's not the black box, I just thought it was funny. That's the, that's the black box. This is kind of an engineering term. Uh, you've, got the, you've got the app, the app is the black box. You do not open the black box. The black box is not for you, not for you. You can control the inputs. The inputs here are user uh, uh, controls, tapping, using buttons, things like that but then you've also got API, API data. Uh, these are the things you control. You are not looking in the black, black box, you're not like setting debug switches. Uh, and then what you're really looking at is the, is the output. Is it doing what you want? Are you getting the UI state that you want? Stuff like that. Uh, why is this good? Well, you're testing the app like a user does. If I'm not breaking into the box setting a debug switch, uh, I, uh, I sort of remove one step where things can go wrong. If I'm testing the app with a, de with a debug switch, I've sort of introduced a little bit of entropy in my testing where maybe how I set this debug switch isn't completely valid. valid. When you're doing something like this, uh, you're actually going through the whole user flow. flow. It's not really a unit test, it's more of an integration test. Uh, so you're, test you're testing your, your JSON parser, you're testing your database saving routines, routines, and you're testing your UI all at once. Uh, you know, bang for the buck, it's, it's probably one of the better ways to test an app. Um, and, and so, 
when we're talking about the API states, you might be asking, well, okay, that's great. I'm not using a debug switch. How am I actually going to test get us getting into all these different states? Well, there's a couple simple ways. I mean, if it, you're pulling data, link data from a server somewhere, obviously you could probably call up the guy running the, running the server and be like, hey, can we get it into this state? This is a good idea. We call these, run, all these running simulations. You should probably do them. They're a good idea. You can get lots of people testing, testing the app all at once. Uh, sort of gets that redundancy part in there, make sure that, sure that as like a more holistic level the app is working. Um, but, but, as you might expect, calling up someone at a data center being like, hey, can you get me, can you get me into the state? That requires a whole lot of scheduling. That might require a whole, a whole bunch of emails back and forth. There might be uh, confusion as to like what state, state you actually want to get into. Well, what if I want to do it at my own desk because I'm trying to just test a feast to feature or something? And so I'm going to plug Charles Proxy a little bit. Um, um, you know, you don't have to use this tool, but I live in this some days. But the idea is you can actually sniff the traffic on your, de your device. You might have seen it um, when you connect to the Wi-Fi. You scroll to the bottom of the name of the network setting. You've got a proxy option down there. What you can do is run a, run a local proxy server on your machine, and you can see all of the traffic going in and, in and out of your device. That means you can see what your app is hitting on the, on the server and what they're getting back from it. And more importantly, you can mutate it, lo it locally on your machine and run your own simulations. Now the, ca now the caveat here is, well, I'm editing the data myself. Did I do it correctly? Maybe did I fat finger something or use the wrong key? So it's important that you actually, you actually have a good data spec so that you know what, you're, what items, items to actually adjust in here. But this is way faster. I don't have to call someone else someone up uh, you know, at a data center and be like, hey, let's get the state going. going. I can do this as many times at my desk as I want to. And again, again, like it's, it's the black box. I'm not mutating the app. I'm just mutating the data input. And so just real quick, tie it all, tie it all together. What have we talked about? So this wasn't really a talk on automa automation. This was really just more a talk on mobile QA in general. You might remember, remember we had that very simple happy path test plan. If you were re really gung-ho about doing automation, that might be a good place to start. Get, get your happy path, start automating that. That's a, those are easier to, uh, to automate than some of the other edge cases. Uh, and then we did, did some deeper analysis on common problems. Yeah, and now you're asking, now that you've told, told, us, told us all this thing about how we do our jobs, how, how does it actually affect you guys, right? Well, we have a process and we need to be working together. Okay. So you look at these state diagrams and test plans and say, well, that's great, how do I read the test, test plan? How do I read the state diagram? Well, if you're looking for a quick way of, hey, hey did we hit all the screens? You look at the left one. It shows you what parts of the screen you, screen you hit in a very visual way. And then you say, well, how, how, do I, how do I know how I did through it and how the order and stuff? Well, that's where the test plan comes, plan comes in. It's very linear. It's very easy to read. Anyone can pick it up like Kirk, like Kirk said. Your mom can run this, and she should get the same results as you did. It's written that, written that way so that it's very readable and very repeatable. So, so where does it fit in the dev process? Well, as QA, we've kind of been, been a lot of places. The black sheep, we sit in the corner, we make your lives miserable. But that's not how it should be. We, we need to move past that and we need to move forward. So we should be there at the beginning with you guys, just as early as you guys are. You guys, you guys get requirements, we get requirements. Like Kirk said, we can start our job just as early as, early as you can without you relying on a line of code. And that requires some structure. We, we need to understand that we are not the same as you, but we need to be in the same, in the same group. We all need to work together. We also need to document everything so that you know, you know what we're doing and we know what you're doing. That's where your tickets come into play, into play. We can see what items you're working on so we can write test cases for those. Also accountability. If we write a test case based on a requirement that you implemented, it should work that way. It's simple as that. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be able, we shouldn't have to say, oh, well, the requirement changed there. We talked about it in a phone, on a phone call. It should be documented. QA can't do their job if there was a phone call they weren't included, included on. Communication, that's back to that part. We need to be on those phone, call, phone calls. We need to be understanding what changes, what does the client want, what, is, what, is the, what are our users doing? We got crashes, why are we getting crashes? Expectations, everyone should understand that if we set a deadline to ship, ship you know, March 15th and we had the last sprint to do our final QA, okay, and dev finishes March 14th, QA is not getting done by March 15th, guys, guys. It's not how it works. We need to make sure that we're all on the same page and understand, understand that to do our job, we need to do our job together. It's not just that you hand it off and you, and you just let QA do their own thing or ship without QA, because that's how you get, you get. Crashes, guys. Crashes are bad. If you have an app and, you, and it gets out in the real world and it crashes, people are going to uninstall it. 
You can you can get an app out there with misspell misspellings, you know, weird image sizes. They might still use your app. Your app. If it crashes, they're not going to use your app. So we need to make sure we fix crashes. Crashes. If you find one, fix it. Work together. It's not that we're making your life your life miserable or you did a bad job. It's just that that's how it goes. We need to fix them. And now we're going to open up to questions. If you have any questions, uh, the first four get a four get a T-shirt. If no one else asks any questions, I suppose. <laughs> the first question is, do you have a formula for the QA team to figure out how much time you think it's going to test now? Is it based on how many states and transit you transitions? Or if you include, the, and, and then the other uh, actually, question is now, do you include the developers and the automated testing, the testing builds, or are you guys strictly doing you know, key punches for the QA team? So to answer your first part about how we calculate things, uh, ours, we should be sitting on the planning meetings. We should understand what the, is, going, is going to go into the dev work. We need to understand how long it's going to take you and why it's going to take you so long, long. So we can then evaluate how long it's going to take us to test all those different states or, states or possible areas that why it took you so long is going to take us as long as long as well. So we need to make sure we're on the same page. We do calculate it. There's no exact form, formula of, OK, it takes five dev hours. It takes 2.2 QA hours. There's no real, no real formula. Because some feature that takes you, you know, 10 minutes may take us a lot, take us a lot longer because there might be 50 states for the same thing you implemented. So we have to get, have to get really a ticket by ticket basis. So you really look at states. Yes. And then your second question about automation. Right now we're doing now we're doing a lot of manual because as we said we are a firm that does a lot of clients. A lot of clients. We do very quick sprints. So to implement automation uh, when you're only, when you're only on the project for two to three weeks and you're spending two to three weeks doing automation, you don't really get to test to test all the different states. And also, um, think just a little bit, a little bit about the like deeper states that we went through. Like, imagine how much harder, the harder those would be to automate versus the happy path states. So, not to say that there isn't there isn't benefit in it, but it's a lot easier to automate a happy path thing. Well, well, those are pretty easy to run too. Think about how hard it would be to test every app launch stage state and start mutating data and getting that to uh, behave not behave nicely with an automation platform. <laughs> Uh, so, what your, one of your paths you always like to test is the upgrade path. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been using these things, uh, Ruby Gem Charles. You can swap out simulator data. So you can archive, like I have like my 2.1 version to do that. Um, but how, do you, how have you found a good way, good way to do that on hardware? Besides finding an, a device that happens to have your app, your app installed, what do you do to manage, like, here's my 1.0 default salt state, and I want to taste the migration to 2.0? How do you get that 1.0 on one, one device? Uh, generally, just the App Store. I mean, we have test devices that we're using in order to do this. Um, if we're shipping an app, to an app to the store, presumably it's there. That's where we can find a 1.0 version of the app, uh, uh, primarily. Through the app, do you historical? How do you download a 1.0 if your app, your client app is currently on 2.3? Oh, okay. Uh, in that case, we do keep archive builds okay. of what old release ones were. Ones were. Um, I think we keep them as XC archives, whatever they are, so we, are, so we can sign them as it, uh, certificates expire and all of that. But we do, we do keep archives so that we can really test any arbitrary And then you keep data along, data along with those archives? So you have like, this is the customer, this, this uh, some domain specific thing, but like this is one edge case customer, customer, and this is one edge case customer that's using the apps. Um, so you don't have to regenerate those states, states by hand every time, or? We do save off a lot of data states. Uh, uh, a lot of times around playoffs, we like to save off playoff states. Or you know, like you know, like draft, we like to save off draft states. So we do a lot of those states, so we keep them on um, our on our local machines or on the servers. So, so about dealing with the QA requirements, mostly useful with apps. <laughs> like like, how do I help them understand some of the differences between doing mobile versus that? And are there some big things that I should? I think I think a big thing is depending on what platform they're used to, Android or iOS for their just just general phones. Get them to install your app and just use it for a while and understand the, understand the difference between things to slide in, slide out. So you want to just get them to use it for a little while. Like that's that ad hoc testing part. Get them to use it, them to use it and then write bugs against those. And those will be things they look for later while they're running test cases. cases. And I think to a certain extent, um, just that like little happy, happy path thing that I did, that's really platform agnostic. Like that probably, probably works for web, and that works for mobile, and that works for just about anything. So, so um, you know, it really sort of depends on how deeply, deeply ingrained they are in web. But these principles really should work for anything. Yeah. So I, I like the, I like the caricature, uh, self-art caricature. You know, and I'm fully endorsing. 
endorsing that idea. There, I, get, I get this attitude sometimes from, and, and from various people that, that, you know, as long as it doesn't crash too much, we're okay. No, I'm not saying, not saying release bugs. I'm saying if you have a choice to fix a spelling error or a crash, crash, fix the crash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm behind this. I'm behind this. But what I'm, what I'm, trying, what I'm trying to get at is I think users are very intolerant of crashes. I mean, I'm kind of saying that. But I'd like some data. I don't know if you've seen data, data on, on user tolerance for this kind of thing. But I'd like some data, data to be able to go and say, look, that's kind of really extreme. Let's put the A bomb for your app, your app right? I mean, don't, we shouldn't be looking at, yeah, yeah, it's important to, important to know that our app crashes this amount. But to, to say that our app only crashes 1% of the time, or 0.1% of the time, or 0.1% 0, 0, 0, 1 of the time, to use that as a measure of quality of the app, of how, how well we're doing on testing, seems like seems backwards to me. Well, um, I don't have any statistics. I mean, I could make one up, and I think that's <laughs> not really the, really the right choice here. But it's just whenever I'm using an app, like if it crashes, just most of the time I just stop caring and go on to something else. So, so, exactly. so like I don't have any numbers, but just anecdotally, like that's my evidence for you, for you right now. But um, it's Pokemon Go. Right. <laughs> well, there was some nostalgia there that kept me going. So. Um, I guess like if you want to play devil's advocate, maybe a crash isn't even the worst thing. Worst thing. And the reason is if you have a crash, you've probably gotten some part of your app, your app into a state you're really not expecting. Like you've got database corruption, corruption, Uh, I think we're running out of time, so if you have any more questions, you can find us around here or on, or on Twitter. Um, also, the slides are up there if you want to copy that down. One, one more. Last just one. I'm just going to throw in this comment. Um, as a developer, I find it very important to listen to, listen to my QA. I somehow have the ability to intuit what mistakes I'm going to make before I even make them. So they'll start asking questions during the planning process, and I'll go, oh, right, oh, right, that's an edge case, I'm going to have to keep in mind. You're one of the good ones. <laughs>